Hello everyone, Christopher Beast here, and today we're going to take a moment to slow down from the fast-paced combat of the new COD and instead look at some of the finer details within its map design, specifically reading the plots within the DMZ History Museum. So with no more delay, let's just get right into this. Starting off, we have this first plaque. Depicted with a medieval-style painting to its left, we can scope in on it reading the following. This fortress, built on the site known today as the al Balra Fortress, has a rich history dating back almost 1,000 years. Construction began towards the end of the 12th century by wayward Italian normal knights returning from campaigns abroad in the kingdoms of Outremer. Many would choose to settle the surrounding region rather than return to the service of their lords and kings in Europe, while others had been employed as mercenaries by the Byzantine Emperor and had ventured further east in the hopes of fame and riches. The region had been known for its textile industry and had become wealthy through its many trading partners as far away as China, Indonesia, and India. With their occupation of the land, the knights encouraged other Normans from Italy, Sicily, and France to migrate, and the port became full of pilgrims traveling to and from Europe. Much like their conquest of England, the considerable wealth of the region incentivized the new Norman overlords to construct a formidable castle that could serve both as a regional garrison and as a seat of power. The elevated coastal outcrop upon which the fortress was built provided a natural defense on three of the four main approaches, which added to the strategic significance of such an outpost. Within a short period of time, the temporary palisade, which had been hastily erected for the knights and their retainees, was converted into a stone keep. A master builder arrived from France to begin working on the adjoining baileys and curtain wall, as well as structures to house and maintain the city's garrison. Hundreds of local artisans and laborers were hired to erect fortifications as quickly as possible. Some of these laborers would remain at the castle as blacksmiths, carpenters, and stonemasons. With little interruptions, construction was completed in 1191. The following centuries would see many renovation projects undertaken to reinforce the citadel's defenses. Additional towers were positioned with arrow loops and merlins to give defenders every possible advantage in the event of an attack. In addition to military structures, by the height of the 14th century, the citadel had an elaborately constructed cistern, providing inhabitants with a fresh supply of water, and it is perhaps the best preserved part of the fortification before the Ottoman renovations. Over the next 300 years, the fortress was crucial to maintaining order within the region. At its height, the castle could support a garrison of nearly 2,000, though the vast majority of these would have been hired soldiers and citizen levies. The number of knights never exceeded more than 200, and they would have mostly lived in the nearby estates. Numerous written and artistic sources cite the castle's involvement in both skirmishes and sieges. In spite of its prominent role in such conflicts, the citadel's walls were never breached nor taken by force. In addition to the height and thickness of the ramparts, the only approach by land was so rocky that it proved nearly impossible to effectively place siege engines, meaning a relatively small number of soldiers could defend an assault by a much larger force. This lengthy text gives us a pretty decent history of the foundation of the fortress, and as well as some of its early history. This can be seen across a bunch of large posters on the walls all across the exhibit. However, there is one other readable in this museum, a small plaque which continues the story. By the end of the 15th century, the influence of the castle and its occupants had waned significantly. With the advent of gunpowder and the rapid expansion of the Ottoman Empire, many Italian and French landowners left for Europe. As the reach of their control shrank, the boldness of pirates and bandits increased. A series of critical defeats at the hands of these mercenaries forced the knights to withdraw the last of their forces into the citadel itself. By the time an Ottoman army had arrived at the gates, the region was no longer under their control, and without the wealth of the surrounding land of leverage, they could no longer afford to raise an army to fight an open battle. In addition to the number in the thousands, the Ottomans had brought artillery and other siege weapons that threatened to easily overwhelm the once impenetrable curtain walls. However, in a show of good faith, envoys were dispatched offering amnesty to the remaining knights, in exchange for the forfeiture of the castle and the surrounding lands, as well as a promise to leave in peace and to not return. The knights would be escorted to the nearby port and granted safe passage west along with their families and servants. After some debate, an agreement was reached with the garrison, numbering nearly 150, who were sailed to Messina in Sicily, ending outside influence in the region until the modern era. And that's both of the readables in the museum. It provides us with some history and lore to this region that is fairly interesting to read. Hopefully you enjoyed this, as I think sometimes stopping to take a deeper look at what's shown to us can be valuable in understanding what exactly is going on in the world we are playing in. But that's all I've got for you guys today. Until next time, this has been Christopher Beast. Ciao.